moving along, moving got, along. Let's go with super color. Let's go with crazy color. Fine, we're gonna we're gonna bring out the Elon Silverstein. Okay. From about 1988 to 2012, Alain Silberstein, a Frenchman who started as an architect and became a watch brand chieftain, built his own crazy quirky watches. Now, while they generally had a sort of Mondrian-esque color scheme, they were not pure primary colors. You can see that those hands are almost like a Riviera blue. The chronograph seconds hand looks all sorts of crazy warped, almost like a wave in space, with a signal yellow worthy of a airfield ambulance. Everything about these watches was nutty, kind of a blend of Mondrian-esque de steel with Dadaism. The watches were all distinctive, and you can see this watch, the Bolito Chrono, powered by a Frederic Piguet 1185 automatic column wheel vertical clutch chronograph, was one of the largest watches of the 1990s. Though it's only 46 millimeters lug to lug and 34 millimeters across, you know what? This this was compared with the Panerai Luminor and the Royal Oak Offshore back in the day when big watches really were not a thing. And it was crazy with huge Broncard style flanks, that wonderfully distorting cambered crystal, and then these wonderful hinge lugs. The watch was made in France, and I would have to say if ever a watch exuded a French sensibility, it's this thing. These are collectible watches now, I feel someday, uh, partly because Alain Silberstein is coming back into style and partly because he was ahead of his time. These will be collectible watches. Ask MBNF about that one. No, I mean, I, I think it's wickedly cool. And I think that this is the sort of the watch when a, like, when a known watch guy is wearing the watch. It's like, oh my God, that's so cool. And if a guy is not a watch guy wearing the watch, they're like, what the hell is he wearing? So I agree with you that I think that he was way too ahead of his time. I think that with the influence that art is now having on the watch market and how they're sort of converging and mixing a lot more now, that the influence that he had is will... I think start translating into more pieces, you know, and he should be doing many more collaborations with people. Like there should be an Alan Silberstein Hublot. Yes. We, we just were talking about that. Him doing a watch with F.P. Journe would be bonkers amazing. They're both French. It makes sense. And F.P. Journe is not a stuck in the mud traditionalist. He does crazy things. Holland and Holland, that's your reference. I'll also say this, something like the Richard Mille Cyril Congo would be absolutely crazy. The RM68 Cyril Congo, that could be done with Alain Silberstein. Richard Mille is a Frenchman. Alain Silberstein is a Frenchman. Please, fate, make this happen. Yeah, I mean, this thing is awesome. Now, he has a lot of other, obviously, watches. It's not just this case. I would probably sooner you know, prefer, you know, a round watch, but, I mean, that thing's like a reverso tripping on acid. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is awesome, and it, again, it's not, this isn't something that would be an everyday wear, but, you know, to be able to whip this thing out every once in a while, I think it's just, it, it's pretty great. And it's a chronograph, guys, king of complications. I'll also say this about Alain Silberstein. Some of the watches that he made that were grand complications are so undervalued right now, it's almost comical. In the recent spate of Far Eastern auctions from Phillips and Christie's, we saw a flying tourbillon with a 70-hour power reserve and a mother-of-pearl dial with hand painting go for under $20,000, 40 millimeters in titanium. It's crazy, but it's not oversized, and it is undervalued. Get them while you can.